we do have now in place in Montgomery County a uh, very, very strong prohibition against the use of toxic chemicals on private property as well as public property. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Montgomery County, which I'm proud to tell you was the home of Rachel Carson. We are the largest county in Maryland, proud of being um, recognized by the Natural Resources Defense Council as the best farmland protection in the entire United States. Out of more than 3,100 counties, we in the 1980s decided to set aside one third of the county for agricultural preservation. And we've passed many laws to protect the public health and safety. Uh, we have a very enlightened body politic, very well educated body politic. We're the home of the National Institutes of Health and many other federal agencies. As you see from the map, uh, we're just immediately north of uh, the District of Columbia. And so our well educated public um, has, over many years, supported efforts to protect public health and safety through strong action at the local level. And one of our municipalities, which happens to be the municipality in which I live, the city of Tacoma Park, Maryland, passed uh, a law that was modeled after the law here in Ogonquit, Maine. And there was quite a strong effort mounted uh, to educate the public about cosmetic law and pesticides, about organic alternatives. Moms, basically, who were concerned about their children's exposure to substances on their neighbor's yards that were causing uh, adverse health effects, uh, Julie and Catherine went to the Tacoma Park City Council, and it was quite a uh, robust dialogue and debate. And during that debate, I live in Tacoma Park, um, Julie and Catherine, who I didn't know at that time, but who I've gotten to know very well, approached me and said, would you as a county council member please write to the mayor and city council in this town, Tacoma Park, where I live, to support this measure? And I declined to do it. I said, first of all, I don't understand the issue. I really don't know about pesticide exposure. And secondly, if I express support for it at the city level, the next step will be you'll come to me and ask me to do it at the county level. And I'm not, I'm not ready for that. I'm just not familiar with it, and I don't want to take that on. It began to dawn on me that um, this certainly wasn't threatening or harmful to anybody's property values. And um, once the Tacoma Park law passed, I was much more open to learning more about the issue. And I, uh, and indeed, as I anticipated, um, the Safe Grow movement um, requested to meet with me. I'm chairman of our county council's health committee. And so I wanted to learn more. And so in the summer of 2013, I asked the chair of the county council's transportation and environment committee to convene a briefing on pesticide use in the county. We heard from our school system, our parks department, both of which reported alarmingly high use of pesticides on playing fields that children utilize. Our county's Department of Environmental Protection and our county's Department of General Services, which oversees county-owned property. We heard from City of Tacoma Park leaders about their Safe Grow law and officials from the District of Columbia government, which has enacted very strong legislation which goes beyond EPA regulations, um, but not as far as the city of Tacoma Park. It prevents the use of cosmetic pesticides on District of Columbia property and then creates buffer zones near watersheds and around childcare facilities. Um, so I came away from the meeting alarmed at the amount of pesticides that were being used on school and park property and persuaded that it was appropriate to act in this area. How many of you are familiar with RISE? So RISE is an interest group funded by the chemical industry which is the enemy of beyond pesticides. If you want an absolute counterpoint uh, to this entire conference, um, rise is it, and there is no issue, and they were active in Ogonquit, Maine, they were active in Tacoma Park, Maryland, no matter how small the community, they view this entire conversation that we're having here in Portland as a threat to their fundamental interests. Monsanto is a uh, primary contributor. Um, but I met, and they hired a local lobbyist, and I met with that individual who by this time had already picked up our Montgomery County Farm Bureau as a client, and then I met with Safe Grow Montgomery universally. Um, the opponents of legislation did not want any conversation, any restriction, any discussion at all. They were not willing to support half measures. They were not willing to support anything. They told me they would fight to the death to prevent it. So um, I knew that this would be a controversial issue. I knew that there would be a significant learning curve, as there had been and continues to be for me. And so I knew that I, we were not going to get any legislation through unless somebody supported it. 
And so the more I listened to Safeco advocates, the more I came to agreement that we needed fundamental change. So we restrict the use of cosmetic, the cosmetic use of EPA registered pesticides in places where children are most likely to be exposed, public as well as private lawns, people's own homes, playgrounds, mulch recreation areas, and children's facilities such as childcare centers. And um, we had intense and stiff opposition from our parks department. Uh, and that was, and there were threats about how recreation facilities, playing fields would become unplayable. And so we had to make a number of compromises with my colleagues. So what we have now is the parks department will conduct a five field pesticide free pilot with the goal of maintaining all playing fields without pesticides by 2020. The bill does not apply to gardens, trees or shrubs, golf courses, uh, playing fields, although the Parks Department will get there by 2020, hardscapes, indoor pest control, the control of noxious weeds or invasive species for human health or agricultural purposes or to prevent significant economic damage. So the County Council held two public hearings, which is unusual. Uh, we usually only have one. Both were standing room only in January and February of 2015. Each was attended by more than 600 people. This was followed by three committee meetings in the spring where council members were briefed on how pesticides are regulated, under-regulated, by the EPA and state, heard from health experts on what the latest science has to say about potential health concerns, and engaged in a back and forth with practitioners of both organic and conventional lawn care. And because of the alarm bells that were being run, uh, rung by our parks department, uh, we did have to make the significant concession of exempting playing fields from the bill and adopting the 2020 date uh, by which the parks department is uh, supposed to go pesticide free. And I share all this with you because I hope that all, each of you will go back to your communities and um, seek similar protective legislation. I see our council member from South Portland is here. Now, why don't you stand up, council member? Let's give her a hand. Huh? You know, this, this is going to happen in communities around the United States, and I hope that our experience will assist you as you're working for this, um, that, you know, these are the kinds of things that occur. So um, this council member, the chairman of the Environment Committee, sent a letter to the National Cancer Institute asking the director of NCI to weigh in on the county's proposed ban, hoping that they would say the science is too inconclusive to justify a ban. He also sought to undermine the bill by requesting that the state attorney general's office issue an opinion on whether the council was preempted by state law from enacting the bill. The attorney general declined at that time to issue an opinion, but later when a state legislator was prompted by the Farm Bureau uh, to ask for an Attorney General's opinion, uh, the uh, Assistant Attorney General opined that it was not clear whether we are preempted, which of course the Farm Bureau and others interpreted as you are preempted and you may not do this. Um, and indeed, it's, you know, it's entirely possible that RISE or other interest groups will take this to court, so we need to be prepared um, as to whether we have authority and jurisdiction under Maryland law to act in this manner. Um, even the morning of the final vote, uh, well, okay, so then later after it got out of committee, this same council member circulated an alternative bill uh, which closely mirrored the discussion draft that I had originally put forth, which would have instituted without a mandate a goal of reducing pesticide use in the county by 50% by 2018 and requiring residents to sign a piece of paper acknowledging that before a lawn care company could apply um, pre-emergence or uh, fertilizers or other uh, substances that they are aware of the health risks posed by pesticides. Um, I know all of you have had the experience of signing contracts that you don't fully understand. Even when you download software, you know, you click, yes, I accept the terms and conditions without reading them. Um, but what he found was that this half measure, as with my half measure earlier, garnered no support from the Farm Bureau or RISE um, and, and that his legislation, his alternative, uh, couldn't succeed if nobody was writing us in support of it. At every step of the way, I communicated with my colleagues. I provided them with the research I was relying on so they could have the benefit of the information that I was using as justification for the bill. Perhaps the strongest argument in favor of our bill was the American Academy of Pediatrics 2012 policy statement, which resonated with council members. Um, 
But after a period of time, the opposition tried to co-opt the policy statement into its own arguments, saying that the statement didn't call for banning pesticides. It instead urged decision makers to implement integrated pest management. The pesticide industry even went so far as to contact authors of the um, American Academy of Pediatrics report and members of the Council on Environmental Health Executive Committee to try to find pediatricians who would say the council's legislation was ill-conceived. They didn't find any. In two years, the opposition ultimately was unsuccessful in finding one single health professional to argue against Bill 5214. In my communications with my fellow council members, I laid out the many ways in which the EPA regulatory approach was broken and failing the public. I highlighted the synergistic effects of pesticides, pointing out that EPA tests chemicals in isolation and that current tests are not representative of real world exposure scenarios. Council members, like the general public, want to believe that the EPA is protecting us, so it was crucial to show how inadequate and out of date the EPA's regulations and regulatory regime is. Because only seven states give their local jurisdictions the ability to legislate in this area, we routinely cited the fact that a majority of provinces in Canada have enacted restrictions on the use of pesticides like the one we were contemplating. Moreover, there were data showing that the lawn care industry in Canada had actually grown in terms of the number of lawn care companies and number of employees per company since the enactment of pesticide bans, which flew in the face of opposition claims that Bill 5214 would put all these lawn care professionals out of business. Some opponents tried to diminish the importance of the data by saying that because it did not distinguish between pesticide applicators and general lawn care companies, you could not conclude that a ban would have a positive economic impact on the industry, but that fortunately was not persuasive to council members. The cost of transitioning to organic lawn care was a big concern to several council members. It was critical to reassure council members that organic lawn care is not cost prohibitive, the council heard from several organic practitioners, and they reported that transitioning to a natural or organic turf management program can cost a little more money in the first year or two, but that come the third or fourth year when you're dealing with healthy soil, homeowners could expect to see cost savings, and by the fifth year could pay as much as 50% or more less than what they previously were paying for conventional turf management. It was important to show the council members that Bill 5214 was not all that radical and that the county council had a long history of applying the precautionary principle to public health issues, whether they were aware of it or not. In the late 1990s, Montgomery County was among the first jurisdictions in the, in the United States to ban smoking in bars and restaurants. In the first years of the 21st century, we prohibited the sale of trans fats in prepared food, and more recently we banned the use of e-cigarettes where traditional cigarettes are already prohibited, and so council members who had voted for all those measures understood that it was an appropriate role for local government to act to protect the public health and safety, even uh, ahead of and in front of the federal government's activity. Uh, I want you to hear these um, examples of the media coverage. We got a lot of attention in the Washington, D.C. area. Next slide. So these are headlines, each of them from the Washington Post. Um, the, uh, the second one was the news article, and I'll play an excerpt from the radio interview where I was roughed up. Um, the, the first headline is a letter to the editor saying that um, crazy liberal Democrats can't be trusted. And then the Washington Post actually ran an editorial um, whose talking points were straight from rise, word for word, titled A Green Plan's Weak, weak Roots. Next slide. And this was an editorial cartoon in our local Gazette newspaper, which described me as Dr. No from James Bond. Um, we, had, uh, we had passed a prohibition on pet stores selling puppies from puppy mills, and we had banned the use of styrofoam, uh, polystyrene products in food service. Uh, I proposed to ban pesticides. We had long ago banned smoking in public places, trans fats, and so they said that um, I was trying to ban fun. Um, 
So they had some fun with me. I, I had never been um, the subject of an editorial cartoon before, and um, I have to say I've been in public office a long time, and so I found it really funny. I laughed at it, as you did, and I circulated it myself on social media because I actually thought it reflected pretty well on me. They don't draw cartoons about you in the newspaper unless you're actually making things happen. So I felt really good about it, and I have a framed... Uh, <laughs> Here, this is where I was on right-wing talk radio. Let me also ask, how are you going to in enforce this uh, pesticide law? Because people can just go over to Prince George's County or go across the river to uh, Virginia and buy these pesticides. Are you going to have people policing what they're putting on their lawn? The bill does not affect the sale of these materials, so they're for sale in Montgomery County. So how are you policing this? Um, like most law, I mean, for example, most local governments um, require that individuals must cut their grass. If your grass grows too long, almost everywhere, I don't think that's considered a nanny state provision. And it's complaint driven. So what will often happen, let's say you have a distressed property or a foreclosed property, neighbors will complain that, um, you know, the property is not being maintained, the grass is not being cut, and then the code enforcement division in this case with lawn uh, getting too high would go and respond to the complaint. In the case of uh, lawn chemicals, it would be the same thing. It would be the Department but, of Environment. But you can still go to Home Depot and get the stuff? Yes, that's correct. What well, well, <laughs> I, I, I'm confused. Why, why in the world would you ban it and then allow it to be sold? Well, there are legal applications even under this bill. For example, this bill doesn't affect agriculture. We're not telling mm -hmm. farmers what they may or may not use. So, so the products are legal and for sale. Wait, so uh, these pesticides are so bad, but it's okay to put it in the food that the farmers are growing? Uh, are, are you asserting the pesticides are bad, or are you being sarcastic? Uh, no, I'm taking your heart. I'm not being sarcastic. I just don't understand the logic behind this. You're saying the pesticides harm the environment, so we can't use it on our lawns, but it's okay for farmers to put it on our food? I don't get that logic. Uh, I understand that you don't get the logic. <laughs> so that was just an example of having to be prepared... Um, you know, it, the opponents would make this case that the bill was flawed. They, they opposed the bill altogether, and just be prepared for this, because if you create any exemption at the insistence of any segment of industry, then other segments of industry will say, because you've granted exemption, the bill is fundamentally flawed. We did not want to debate the agriculture issue. We were taking on something where it was vividly clear that homeowners have natural and organic alternatives available to them. We value our agriculture industry. I'm certainly cognizant of the public health concerns as we've been detailing this weekend, but there were certain fights that we didn't feel that we were ready to take on. This was the excerpt from the Washington Post. This is straight out of Rise's propaganda. Sponsored by County Council President George Leventhal, the bill to ban the use of such products is largely symbolic. That alone makes it unconvincing. It would exempt farmland, some county-owned property, and possibly other tracts, meaning much of Montgomery acreage would get a pass. There'd be little real enforcement beyond neighbors tattling on each other. Sale of the products would still be allowed. No county inspectors would fan out to survey tens of thousands of yards. I assure you they don't support having county inspectors or lawn police. They, don't, they weren't proposing that we include farmland or golf courses. Um, and fines would top out at $75, not exactly a muscular deterrence regime. Here again, had we come in with a very heavy-handed approach with high fines at the beginning of something that people really didn't understand very well, we would have been attacked for that. So, you, you know, you're going to be criticized no matter what approach you take. It's going to change the way a lot of local residents care for their landscaping. Montgomery County passed a tough new law today that bans pesticides from private lawns. But as News Force Chris Gordon reports, now it's such a contentious issue it may face a court challenge. TS Bill 5214 is adopted on a 6 to 3 vote. Parents wearing the green shirt celebrated. In blue, lawn care professionals are left worrying what the pesticide ban will mean to them. No, we're not allowed to use certain things. Your results are going to be minimal. And in the long term, I really think it'll put it the industry out of business. The Montgomery County Council is the first government in the U.S. to ban pesticides on private lawns. They can't be used after January 1st, 2018, and the council ordered County Parks and Recreation to find safer alternatives for playing fields by 2020. The technology and methodology exists to have beautiful green lush lawns with the use of organic and natural methods not requiring the poisoning of our soil. 
Leventhal was hugged by members of the group Safe Grow Montgomery, who worry about the health dangers of pesticides to people and pets. I can't believe it, really, that we've gotten to uh, today and that we actually have had this vote passed to protect our health and the, protect the health of our kids, of our neighbors, of workers, everybody. Lawn care professionals say this fight may not be over. Meaning there could be litigation, things could change between now and January 1st, 2018. Opponents of the pesticide ban raise the possibility that they might seek a referendum to ask the voters to decide whether or not they want a pesticide ban. In Montgomery County, Chris Gordon, News 4. Overwhelmingly, thanks to the great efforts of Safe Grow Montgomery, heard more on a 75-25% ratio from those who supported it. So they were moms. Uh, this is um, Catherine Cummings, Julie Tadeo, Alex Stavisky Zinedine, and Ling Tan, um, who wanted to protect their kids. Next slide. And we also built a broad-based coalition of environmental, health, community, and business interests. The Sierra Club assisted us, and uh, my great friend Scott Nash, if you um, are familiar with his uh, chain of organic groceries, Mom's Organic Market, uh, strongly endorsed the bill and distributed material at his stores supporting the bill. Next slide. And uh, it was really funny, Safe Grow Montgomery, they were great to work with, I just, I just love them. And uh, they had a sense of humor, which is always welcome. Um, my colleague who I mentioned earlier, who chairs the Environment Committee, uh, predicted a citizen rebellion if Montgomery County passed Bill 5214, and so Safe Grow Montgomery imagined uh, what that citizen rebellion would look like. Who, who are these people with the pitchforks who want more pesticides in their park and need them now? Um, this was just one of many examples of a very strong presence, which really kind of shamed the opponents of the bill um, you know, into understanding that their position was not popular and that it couldn't, couldn't be defended. It was just great work. I've never worked with a, a pun intended, grassroots group um, as effective uh, and energetic as this one. It's just been a privilege to work with them and to continue working with them. When uh, there was criticism of the bill, they weighed in. Uh, here's Jennifer Quinn, one of the other uh, moms supporting the bill, writing to the Gazette, um, illustrated by the cartoon I showed you earlier, supporting me and supporting the lawn care bill. And, you know, look, it is really important to thank your courageous legislators who are out front on this. I'm grateful to be on Pesticides for giving me this opportunity. When, when you have an elected official who's willing to take the heat and stand up to this, thank that elected official and show them the love. It really makes a lot of difference, as you all are doing just by having me here in Portland. We developed a network of local health professionals who spoke in favor of the bill. Here we have a pediatrician, epidemiologist, and the dean for global health at Mount Sinai uh, testifying in support of our uh, ordinance. I'm going to close with some suggestions for other communities that want to take this on. Uh, you really do need to work with your parks department. Our bill was significantly weakened uh, because of opposition from the Parks Department. And I know um, that the city of Boulder, who's represented here at this conference, has had a lot of success on its playing fields. We've, we, all of us, beyond pesticides around the country, have got to assemble successful examples to go up against uh, those who will ring the alarm bells about this. And begin with a briefing. Um, you know, just begin with information. Um, once you get the information, elected officials start to understand there's something not right about exposing children uh, and community members and pets. Uh, enormous number of concerns raised by pet owners who found that once the lawn had been treated, um, the pets would come in with um, tumorous growths and um, other problems from exposure. So just a briefing is the dawning of consciousness. I urge you to have an established advocacy network before a bill is introduced. Highlight areas, including Montgomery County, Maryland, um, where the elected body in, in your own jurisdiction has applied a precautionary principle previously, and um, elected officials need to be reassured about the cost and efficacy of organic lawn care. So if you can identify organic practitioners in your jurisdiction, it helps to have a relationship with those lawn care professionals. That's my presentation. I just want to, again, tell you how delighted and honored I am to uh, join this convocation of people who care about this righteous issue. It's been a great learning opportunity for me to be here. I've gotten a ton of good ideas to go back to Montgomery County with and to try to implement. I'm eager to stay in contact with all of you, uh, and I just commend all of you for taking this on. It's not easy anytime you go up against 
well-funded, organized interest groups, um, you know that uh, you know, it's going to be challenging, but we did ultimately prevail in the Washington, D.C. suburbs, and I'm confident that this is a movement that's going to grow around the United States. One of my colleagues, Tom Hucker, uh, on the Montgomery County Council said what I think is um, one of the best things I heard about this. He said, I'd rather have my kids play on a field with a few weeds and no chemicals than on a field that's been treated with chemicals that has no weeds. Thank you very much.